Good morning, folks. Um, we are at the hour. Welcome once again to the uh, Covenant class. And today it's a privilege to introduce John Kirkendall one more time, who will lead us in this exploration of preachers in fiction. John, it's all yours. Thank you, Sterling. Can you all hear me all right? I can't hear myself, so I hope you can. Uh, this is the second of three in the session. Last week, I gave you a pop quiz. I don't have a quiz for today. However, next week being the last session, we may have a final exam. I'm just not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here by myself. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just uh, re refresh our memory about last week just a little bit. In addition to having a good time testing our knowledge and our ignorance about ministers in fiction and in film, uh, and you all gave me some wonderful suggestions. A couple of people uh, did what I asked you to do. That sent me emails during the middle of the week and help me kind of focus on the ones I wanted to deal with. Uh, some of the suggestions I hope John and I will be able to pick up on in uh, looking at film, because some of the suggestions were made were not only in, in, in written form, but in film form as well. And of course, uh, at least one of the ones today is uh, very much famous, more famous for film than it is for the book itself, but I can just kind of sorted it out to get a point counterpoint in terms of profiles and personalities. Last week I reminded you, and we didn't need any reminding, of the shuffling of the deck with regard to the trust that our society places in different uh, professions and vocations. And of course last week I said to you that on one of the studies I looked at that the ministry was down there about number 12 between uh, I think it was ad writers and, and uh, pol politicians, something like that, way down at the bottom anyway. So we bear that in mind as a kind of a uh, backdrop for the study we're doing and the way that our society looks at these works of fiction. Uh, second thing I mentioned to you, and we'll see it very much today in the four examples that I picked out, is the way in which the historical perspective of what makes a ministry changes. And even in the relatively brief history of the American population, we've seen, I suppose, a half dozen different major orientations to what it means to be a minister. So uh, bear that in mind as we talk about the particular books and when it is that they were written. I also said something to you about uh, what I call the bifocal analysis. That is to say, uh, the way in which we look at, at a story which is told to us has to do, first of all, with the setting of the story itself. When did it happen, as far as the writer is concerned? Even if it's fiction, is there time, and is there a setting in time, or what the Germans call a Sitz im Leben? Is there, is there a place where this person belongs? And secondly, is there a place where the writer belongs vis-a-vis -vis what he or she is writing? And of course, the third dimension of that is, is there a place where we are as we read it? So it's really kind of a trifocal view. And the final thing I would remind you of is, as we looked at these people last week, and as we put things on the blackboard, we talked about these various personality types and the characteristics, uh, sometimes not simply uh, personality characteristics, but moral ethical characteristics of a particular fictional character. I don't know if you noticed last week, but remember we had a board on both sides with with adjectives that you said, A, over here, how would you describe a good minister? And we talked about the virtues of the particular uh, pastoral care that we have in this church. How would you describe those people in terms of, of adjectives? And then on the other side, how would you describe some of these fictional characters in regard to what you see as uh, the nature of their personality? And I don't know if you looked at it. I looked, Missy took a picture of it for me. I looked at it this week. And, it's amazing, you know. Everything over here is really good. They're compassionate, they're thoughtful, they're faithful, they're all these things. Everything over here is pretty much bad. <laughs> so it tells you something about what we're looking at, and we'll find it today. 
Now, today, and I don't know how far we're going to get. If we don't get through it all, uh, you can drop by the house and we'll talk about it later. But, <laughs> but, but I picked out four fictional case studies, and, and the one uh, final characteristic that made me choose these versus others is that the particular ministerial character is focal throughout the whole narrative. It's not just a pastor that drops by the house and says something. It's not just a pastor who is in a particular circumstance in the novel and is a major character there but really doesn't show up very much otherwise. In every instance today, uh, the pastoral figure is right through the whole thing, uh, sometimes almost oppressively so. So uh, that's the way I chose these four. Uh, several of you suggested others, and they were kind of on my taxi squad. I would have pulled them out if I thought we had more time, but I know we don't. So let me tell you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to give you a brief kind of a summary overview, author, uh, context in which the story is told, major factors in the story which is told, uh, and then uh, the, third, four, the fourth thing on the list has to do with uh, the significance of the story. In the first two instances, both then and now, uh, after that, so these, because these stories are more or less current, we just talk about significance now. So, and that's where you come in. I'll do the first three. You can chime in if you want to, if I've got something wrong or if you want to add something. But then when we get down to the significance, it's in your court. And I'm going to expect you to kind of respond uh, as you think about what it might have meant in the context in which it was written and certainly what it means to us as we think about works like this today. So we begin, and I'm going to try to keep on time if I can. The first of the four that I chose, uh, by far the best known, uh, everybody studied in the 10th grade, and the purpose was to say to young women, you might get in trouble and get the A, and to young men, you better watch out or you'll come out like Roger Dimsdale. But in any event, most people get this early on in their reading, uh, but not necessarily in their understanding. I have to say I still don't understand it completely. I read it most recently a couple of years ago. It had a lot more meaning to me than it did at Myers Park High School, but it still got so much embedded in it. This is an incredible work. The author, of course, is this man named Nathaniel Hawthorne, born in 1804, died in 1864. His family had a long connection with the city or uh, town of Salem, Massachusetts. His, the, the Hawthorns, they were Haythorns at first, but the Hawthorns were there from time immemorial almost. One of his ancestors was a judge, a magistrate, and he, uh, charged a, a Quaker woman uh, with being a Quaker and had her whipped publicly. And that person's son, or maybe grandson, happened to be one of the three magistrates on the court that did the Salem witch trial. So you can tell he had a long background in Salem. And by the way, that kind of haunted him the rest of his life. He, did, he was not improvident, but he never had enough money, it seems like. And one of the things he said was all these other people who lived in Salem for generations came out just fine. They were they were traders, uh, had ships going hither and yon, and his family was probably being cursed because of their uh, role in uh, persecution of, of Quakers and people in the witch trials. I don't know that there's any validity to that, but he speculated from time to time. Went to Bowdoin College. After that, uh, kind of finding himself for a while, he had patronage jobs along the way in the Custom House in Salem, also in Boston, uh, he ended his life, or the last 10 years of his life, as a consul, economic consul in Liverpool, England. So he, he was kind of on the, the public uh, dole <laughs> along the way. And none of these books that he wrote, and, and Scarlet Letter was incredibly popular, but none of them got a lot of money for him, so he lived kind of hand to mouth. Living in the time which he did, first half of the, of the 19th century, he knew the transcendentalists. He spent a few months at Brook Farm uh, trying to figure out if that was his destiny. Turned out it wasn't. He was, he was uh, best friends with Melville for a, a long period of life, and then they had a falling out. The thing about it which is important to us is he was a student of Calvinism. He studied the history, uh, the colonial history of New England, uh, with, with great diligence. A lot of his books uh, are focused in that, and most of the settings are pretty much accurate with regard to details. But he, uh, he, he had studied Calvinism. He was not a believer. He was, 
he was, I, I guess you would say he was a critic more than a believer, but he was very serious about what Calvinism uh, meant in, uh, in the life of the American nation. The context in which he wrote was a nation coming of age. Uh, the first half of the 19th century uh, in, uh, in the life of the United States was uh, a period of time in which it was finding its place among the array of the nations of the world. Uh, but it was facing serious problems, as we all know. By the time this book was written in 1850 or 1851, uh, the nation was already uh, deeply divided over the issue of slavery, and every political event that took place seemed to have something about it to do with where you were on this idea of chattel slavery in America. So he was living in a troubled nation. One of the things that was clearest to him, and, and everybody else too, was that the kind of puritical hegemony which had controlled kind of the, the theological mentality of the nation, this, this Puritan Orthodox Calvinism, which is a Calvinism two or three generations removed from John Calvin's perception of what the Christian faith was, and it was, it was very dogmatic, it was very rationalistic, it was very, uh, it was very set in stone as far as the people who, uh, who, uh, who maintained Calvinism. And it was coming apart. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote that famous story about the wonderful one-horse shay that came apart all at once and nothing first. Well, that's what was happening to this particular dominating theological conviction in America at that time. And, and I think uh, uh, Hawthorne was very much aware of the fact that that was taking place. In its place, oh, oh, one other thing about the religious setting, there, there had been a great awakening during colonial America, so-called. It was a revival period in life in 1730s, 1740s, kind of echoed almost down to the time of the American Revolution. Then there had been a second great awakening, which was, if anything, more pervasive, more extensive, and more influential than the first great awakening was. And it had begun around the turn of the century. It had its run until the middle of the fourth decade, probably, of uh, the century. In each one of these uh, awakenings, as you may know, there were personalities that rose to the surface. In the first one, there was George Whitfield, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, several others. In the second one, the, the, the salient person was a man called Charles Grandison Finney, who had been a lawyer and then converted to being a preacher. And he really was kind of the, the person who initiated what we know of as revivalism today in many respects. But the point to be made here about that is the Great Awakening was in decline. Second Great Awakening was in decline. It had left its footprint all over the American map. And yet there was nothing there that was kind of a religious vacuum of sorts. Denominationalism was on the rise. And that meant that people who were non-denominational couldn't find much of a place to sit. In all of this that's taking place, uh, Hawthorne looks way back. He looks back to the Massachusetts Bay Colony of the 1640s. Now, bear in mind, Massachusetts Bay Colony was established in 1630, and I, you don't need to remember all the details, but what happened was uh, the Massachusetts Bay Company made a kind of an in run on the crowd, got the charter to the colony, put it in their pockets, and went off to the New World. So, in essence, they were about to establish what, for a while at least, would look like an independent nation. What? but they tried it for a while. And the way that governance took place in Massachusetts Bay Colony was this kind of holy or unholy coalition between the political powers, the governor and his staff, and the religious powers, the, the, the leaders of the churches. Uh, the churches in New England for a long time were called the Standing Order because they were the, they were the structure under which life was being controlled in New England, certainly almost to, down to the time of the American Revolution. So you have in this instance is a situation in which if you look back at it you've got what appears to be a kind of a theocracy. So that sort of a context, oh and one other thing about the context romanticism as, as a force in literature, as a force in other parts of human life romanticism was in the rise and I don't know if you've noticed it but several of Hawthorne's books are called a romance. The Scarlet Letter, a romance. Wait a minute. Didn't get that part of it. <laughs> I mean, maybe that. Well, I won't say any more about that. But
But, but in any event, you have this kind of a circumstance in which a story is, is being played out. The, the story itself is a very simple but elegant architectural structure of, of three personalities or perhaps three personalities plus a, a corporate personality. Three personalities, of course, are uh, this woman called Hester Prynne, who is, uh, who is uh, apparently has, has been married in England, comes to the colonies without her husband. Uh, she strikes up a liaison with the minister in the community whose name is Arthur Dimsdale, and uh, he's the second personality in all this. Uh, uh, not too long thereafter, the third personality shows up, and that is a man called Roger Chillingworth, who is Hester Prynne's husband, come over from England a few years after she has come. So those three, the interplay of those three personalities are really what this story is all about. However, there's a fourth corporate personality, that, and that is the Puritan community. Much of what happens in the lives of these free, free people happens because there is this strong community of faith and politics which surrounds the whole thing. We might call it a theocracy, though that really doesn't quite measure up to what it was, but it was a holy alliance or an unholy alliance between church and state in which there's kind of a seamless web here. Now the story, of course, is Hester Pratt has a child whose name is Pearl out of wedlock and she is punished by the theocratic community by forced, being forced to wear a scarlet letter A. And that doesn't mean the University of Alabama. <laughs> uh, she is condemned within the community, but she will not disclose the name of the father. And the father, of course, is Arthur Dimsdale, the minister in the community, who is a revered community le leader and, as I said, parenthetically, a first-rate coward as well. But there he is in the community. She is there with him. She will not reveal it. He is living with the reality of the fact that, that this is his child, that there is, there is sin and guilt and everything else involved in it, and yet he has to maintain the, the outward, uh, outward standards of being a minister and a person who's blameless. Then, of course, uh, comes the husband, Chillingsworth, Chillingworth who is... Uh, a self-styled physician, psychiatrist sort of person. He arrives from England. He understands what the secret is. He's in the crowd when Hester is publicly shamed on the scaffold with the A and all that. And he tells her, don't say anything. Don't break the silence. And he doesn't reveal his relationship to Hester. He befriends Dimsdale, who is uh, kind of declining because of guilt and health problems. And and they eventually they wind up living in the same facility, in the same building. And, and he, he Chillingworth, uh, does what he can to break down Dimsdale and force him eventually to confess his indiscretion. Of course, uh, the way that goes is that uh, Dimsdale uh, declines in health and in mental acuity and in emotional health. And eventually he owns his sin on the scaffold in public with Hester and Pearl by his side. And then, of course, he dies. And Hester becomes a valued caregiver and woman in the community. The A becomes almost a badge of honor because of the way she lives her life. So that's the story. A contemporary critic who was a minister uh, writing about Hawthorne's book said, it was a nauseous uh, amour of a Puritan pastor. And that was the significance as far as he was concerned. <laughs> What's the significance as far as you're concerned, then or now? Certainly, I thought you were going to say something. No. then, when it was written, what would it have been like? We can do that too, but both. We could have this conversation at home. Somebody... <laughs>
about this. How do you think the, the population took? It was vastly populous. His most popular work. It sold out in no time flat. What was going on? No, you didn't. Sorry. Sorry. I, I would assume that a lot of that was going on all over the place, but hidden. A lot of which? Well, the, uh, the, the extramarital lays on whatever, don't you think? I mean, that's what well, I... It's like being what it is, but I, I don't think they did any studies of it. But well, no, but, <laughs> uh, you know, and today... I guess it's somewhat diluted. It's going on, but it's accepted more. Huh. At least that's the way it so appears. So in other words, that kind of interaction between pastor and parishioner being more than spiritual was a point that was being made there. Well, I'll pass. Okay, <laughs> right. okay Eric, you next. Well, I think in society until the 50s and early 60s, so having a child out of wedlock was definitely a sin in civilization as we know it. Uh, that seemed to have changed. Uh, but I suspect, remember when uh, Jimmy Carter said he, he sins in his thoughts? Lust in his heart. Lust in his thoughts. And I suspect that uh, ministers are nothing but human. And so, you know, there are thoughts like that too. That's a fair observation, yeah. Uh, you talk about 1950s and 60s. Well, 1850s and 60s, as you pointed out, would, it would have been really an abomination. It would have been you know, career over, go find yourself something else to do in a place far away, yeah. I wonder if Lord? at the, the time this book came out, it was rather shocking. Yeah. And, and so people you know, the human nature kind of enjoys sensationalism, so maybe that was why it was so popular, but I think the thought of a minister doing that must have been very shocking but, at the time. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? I was just going to say, we use that term puritanical even today huh? uh, to judge things that, for instance, what we're seeing on TV, if we don't like it, we'll say, well, we're kind of puritanical about that. In other words, it's not part of the uh, civilization that we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'd also add that having experienced in the last 15 years of relationship between a minister and a parishioner, the minister lost his job. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily just dealing with the 18th and 19th centuries. Is this thing about sex? It's about domination or, or male society in a puritanical society. It's totally male dominated. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the female keeps quiet and gets the shame, doesn't say a word, mm -hmm. because that is the society that they lived in then. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, very much oppressed women. Mm -hmm. Don't speak up, don't, don't say a word. So I don't think she consented, maybe. <laughs> She might have not had a safe word. I don't oh. <laughs> we'll have to go, go back and exegete it pretty carefully, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, that, there's the male-female thing there for sure. I'm not sure how self-consciously Hawthorne was dealing with that, but, but it's there, certainly. Yeah. And that's something that a, that a 21st century person would, re, would see immediately, as you did, Anne. That's probably what these 10th graders see immediately, too. So I, I think, I, you know, I bet you 10th graders today read this book entirely differently than 10th graders in the 1950s, for sure. Bill? 1850 was a pretty chaotic period in American history. Absolutely. Slavery, the 
obvious issue, but there were so many other sectional and um, ethical and moral issues brewing. And I wonder if people saw other things in it, um, even that as a glorious past when the rules were, uh, people were trying to hold the rules and 1850 they weren't. And things were pretty much exploding and socially and politically and economically. Yeah. The yeah. other thing is, I, my family are Puritans, 1629. And I always wonder, we, we know we were descended from a black sheep, but we don't know anything about <laughs> what he did. Uh, not the original guy, the grandson. Um, and um, I've always wondered, <laughs> was he a Dimsdale or we don't know. But he was driven out of his community and had to move to uh, um, Windsor Locks from from uh, Boston. Boy, you've revealed the whole family, right? <laughs> Steve? I think of the intellectual ferment of the time. Uh, you mentioned how um, the question of slavery had an impact on everything else then. And I'm remembering from, you would know this a lot better than I, from Sidney Alstrom's history of the, Amer religious history of the American people, how the Orthodox Christianity of New England changed because Southerners had gone Orthodox with claiming the Bible as support for slavery. And so that, in reaction to that, that was partly why New England became so much less Orthodox by that time. There had already been what was referred to as the Unitarian landslide, which was taking Calvinism and just kind of washing it out. And that really dominated New England society more so than, than the Puritanism did at that point. Yeah. Anyone else? Let's go from the sublime, or not, not sublime, but let's go to the ridiculous next. Uh, Elva Gantry. Uh, author of Sinclair Lewis, uh, late uh, 19th, early 20th century, first half of the 20th century, first American, by the way, to win the Nobel Prize in Literature, which just blows my mind, having read three or four of his books. Uh, Sinclair Lewis was, was, a, was a social gadfly. He was contrary, he was irreverent, he was cynical, but he was always very perceptive and pretty well educated in the matters which he took chose to skewer, uh, which seemed to be almost every self-important American enterprise, uh, community life in Main Street, business in Babbitt, uh, medicine in, in Aerosmith, and now we come to religion with Elma Gantry. Now, by the way, before we go any further on this, the Sinclair Lewis representation of Elma Gantry is strung together with a kind of a sexual biography of a particular individual through a career in ministry. The story, however, is really eclipsed almost entirely by the, what Burt Lancaster did with it in, uh, I think it's 1960, in the film that sticks in your mind because it's a very visible representation. I thought a long time about whether to try to get a clip from that film for next week instead of doing this, but I thought since uh, this, is a, this is a lineal, continuing narrative of one individual that I picked this instead book was written in 1927. Uh, it's based on a research experience, if you can call it that, uh, in which uh, Sinclair Lewis went to Kansas City and lived there for several months and set up a seminar with the major Protestant ministers of the community, about 20 of them, and they met once a week and he would ask the, them uh, pretty uh, aggressive kinds of questions like, why don't you just admit to your congregation you're an agnostic and get them to kind of come out? And he invested himself so much in this research experience that he actually, from time to time, asked and was invited or, or accepted invitations to preach from the pulpits of these people. Now, Sinclair Lewis was not a believer. He was a very perceptive, quote, researcher. And he was living in a time, as I, as I indicated to you in talking about the context, in which there were these uh, countervailing forces in American religion which were very challenging. Uh, one of them was the fact that in the latter half of the 19th century, there had been numerous intellectual explosions that just blew apart the usual uh, traditional uh, uh, understanding of what faith was all about. Darwin, Freud, Marx, all these people come along with ideas that challenge 
what most people thought the Christian faith was all about. And what you have then is a kind of a spectrum of responses. You have on the one hand people who accept everything that's said by every new idea and they try somehow to make that work in the religious faith that they had many times unsuccessfully. At the other extreme, there are these people who say, wait a minute, dig in your heels. We cannot let these sorts of things dominate what religion is all about. Go back to the fundamentals of faith. And along about the beginning of the 20th century, the date I didn't get a chance to look up, uh, in the midst of this wing of Protestantism, there began to develop some, some documents which are largely premised upon what's called scholastic Calvinism, which is John Calvin's thought embedded in the kind of rationalistic thought that one A leads to B, B leads to C. And those people who began to put together these little pamphlets about these various doctrines called the set of the doctrines the fundamentals. And therefore, people who embraced this approach to Christian religion were called the fundamentalists. And they still are today. But in any event, fundamentalism was emerging in the life of the religious community in the United States at just this time because of intellectual challenges. On the other hand, you also see at the same time a kind of uh, perception that revivalism, which has been kind of the lifeblood uh, of the pumping heart of Christianity ever since the 1740s, revivalism has kind of gone to seed. After Charles Finney, there was what one writer calls the, a, a legion of small men, quote, men, uh, evangelists who were kind of picking up on the, the practices of what Finney and his successor uh, by a generation, Dwight Moody, had done and trying to popularize it all over the country. So you have this, this kind of network of traveling evangelists, sometimes taking their own tent with them, sometimes preaching in the churches they could get to, but it became more and more kind of a competition for the saving of souls. Uh, in the midst of this, right before St. Clair Lewis writes this book, you have uh, the emergence on the religious scene of Billy Sunday. If you have never uh, read anything about Billy Sunday, you won't believe what you read if you read it because he was a good field, no hit infielder for the Chicago White Sox who was also an alcoholic who had a conversion experience and began to preach. He was rough as a cob in terms of his language, in terms of his approach to things. Uh, he would do such things as run across the stage on the, in the auditorium where he was preaching and slide into home base, which was heaven, just before <laughs> the devil could get him. So, but anyway, <laughs> he was a showman, pure and simple. And his career lasted up to World War, almost up to World War I. So in the immediate after, uh, uh, prologue to what Sinclair Lewis is trying to do, on the one hand, you've got fundamentalism hammering away at the Christian public in America. On the other hand, you have revivalism kind of in disarray. Uh, one of the authors I read in preparing for this spoke of this whole thing is slimy materialism. But in any event, uh, what was happening was something which was a sign of the times for sure. The story is set, as you may know, in the Midwest at a time roughly contemporary uh, with the 1920s. The book was written in 1927, I think. And the story, of course, is uh, focused around this one personality, Elmer Gantry, a uh, college football star who gets religion or some, something akin to religion, when he's a senior in college and decides that the ministry is the good business to get into, goes to seminary, gets thrown out of seminary, uh, discovers a lucrative vocation in, on the fringes of traditional religion. And of course, as I mentioned in the little notes there, there, there are several, uh, several women who are his supporting cast in this story in a variety of ways, some of which are sexual. He seems to have been possessed of a remarkable libido throughout the whole story. Now, two of these people in particular we ought to take note of. One of them is a woman called Sharon Faulkner who has a tent revival that he walks up to. Uh, Sharon Faulkner is modeled on the uh, Pentecostal four square gospel evangelist Amy Simple McPherson, the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. And this person also is a canny, shrewd person. 
The second woman, woman that I would mention is a woman called Hetty Dowler, who was his quote unquote confidential secretary. And he and Hetty are sitting on the couch in her apartment one night, and in walks her quote husband, demanding something like fifty thousand dollars, which kind of uh, <laughs> put a kink in <laughs> in uh, Elmer's prospects for the future. But of course, then a lawyer gets him out of all that. The book mainly chronicles his progress as a purveyor of religion as a business. This is what's sometimes referred to as commercial preaching. He's trying to figure out how you can make the most money out of the kind of ministry you do. Uh, belief and doubt sometimes occur in him. You see certain uh, instances in which he is repentant and trying to get himself straightened out. And then, of course, doubt overcomes that and other emotions as well and he loses his place. Eventually, he moves from non-denominational ministry into the Methodist church and works his way up the Methodist ladder, but each time he gets into a position that seems to be stable, something goes wrong. So this is a story which is a kind of a, uh, I guess I'd say a comic tragedy in some ways of an individual whose ministry is something which is built upon his own perspective of where the most lucrative future may be personally. Well, enough on that. You all saw the movie. Many of you read the book, too, I'm sure. What's the significance of it? What would it have been like in the 1920s? Prophetic, absolutely, yeah. Sterling's carrying the mic again. I apologize. Van's got his hand up in the back. Oh, he said it was this. prophetic, so. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Sounds like a preview of Jim Baker. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, when you get around talking about the significance now, how would you read it now? Television evangelism Absolutely. and the merchandise church. that we have if you only send in 10 bucks or more. Exactly. You know, it's the commercial game again, all over again. Uh, and, and, you know, I suppose at the time he was writing, there was some uh, manipulation of the media, but it was just beginning, radio evangelism, something like that. But yes, exactly. That's right. I can hardly wait till we get to something that's good about pastors. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around. Be, being one, but just a couple of comments and then a, a, a couple of comments. Uh, I heard the definition of Puritans being people who are desperately afraid that somebody somewhere might be having fun. Um, I think that's H.L. Lincoln, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the... Uh, the, the, the second example we have here with Elmer Gantry, this is outside the organized church. And I think the, the evangelism, the televangelisms and so on are, are outside the organized church, whereas in our own times we are having scandals of pedophilia in, in Roman Catholic tradition. And also that uh, pastors are in a rather unique position in, in, in two ways. Uh, first of all, uh, the freedom to make house calls uh, allows pastors to be very vulnerable. And most of the traditions at this point have something called boundaries training, where you don't step over boundaries so you don't get into things like this. Um, the other is that we've recognized the, uh, the danger, uh, the prob problems with uh, a, a male in authority um, having some uh, uh, control over women not in authority. And uh, the, at least the, uh, the Hester Prynne situation was that, and I think there was some of that in Gantry as well. Thank you, very true. In all cases, I would point out one, one thing though, and that is, uh, in order to get validation, somehow, Elmer Gentry figures he's got to join a denomination. This is in the uh, early 20th century. That wouldn't be the case now. 
denominations do not have that kind of clout in the larger society anymore. Well, talk a little bit about the mega church too, and, and I'm thinking about, uh, you're talking about Elmer Gantry seeing this as a business thing, a way to make money. I wonder if that's what's going on in some of these mega churches. I, I'm sure it is. It's gospel of success, to mention no names called us to him, but no, but, <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I'm sure it absolutely is. Now, not always. And, you know, you can't do the generalization without looking at the counterpoint to this, too. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, denominationalism, all of us are here today, denominationalism is not dead, but denominationalism is not very healthy at this point in time, too. And you notice Elmer eventually hooks up in the Methodist connection to try to make his way up to respectability, that's not necessary anymore. We're not, I can tell we're not going to get to Jan Karen, but one interesting thing about Jan Karen was she was a kind of a lost soul, had a very, very interesting and troubled early life, and she wound up getting religion, quote, unquote, at Calvary Church in Charlotte when Ross Rhodes was a minister there. So, it, you know, that kind of parachurch, sometimes quasi-denominational thing, uh, is not the only route these days by far. Let's do one more, and then, then we have to quit. I'll, I'll tell you about uh, Mitford later on. You probably already know it anyway. Uh, now, Gilead, this is, for my mind, this is the most intriguing and, and probably the most meaningful for our generation of the three that we've done so far. Marilyn Robinson, Born in 1943, still living. She was on the faculty of our, our, our writer's workshop. Uh, graduated from Brown, has a PhD from the University of Washington in English literature. Uh, in 2005, she wrote, 2004-5, uh, she, she wrote Gilead. Second novel she'd written, the first one was kind of uh, mildly favorably reviewed, but this one really took off. Uh, the context, of course, uh, it was written in 2004-05, uh, times that most of, all of us in this room have lived through, and it's, a, a part, it's the first of four books of a series, two of which are sequels and one is a prequel, but Gilead is kind of the lodestone of the whole thing. The setting is in a small village of Gilead, made up village, Gilead, Iowa, in the 1950s, uh, the letters that are that make up this novel it's an epistolary novel it's a it's a novel that the father is writing to his very young son the father old and the, and the son not not old at all maybe it's 7 years old uh, but the theology in this particular book is overwhelming but it is it is um, it's disguised is something else. You cannot miss a word in this book because every word in the book is important somehow. But theological themes, one of my friends wrote a book review on this and I looked over it last night and he said the themes of faith, fallen nature, envy, abandonment, loneliness, uh, family, community, love, and grace. Well, uh, there you have it. <laughs> Lots of stuff going on here. The key figure, of course, is John Ames. He's a 76-year-old Congregationalist pastor who is in poor health. He's got a bad heart. And he is writing this long and very loving letter to his seven-year-old son, born to a much younger but devoted wife of his. His ministry had been in the same congregation, which was served by his father and his grandfather before him. His grandfather was an abolitionist out of Maine, a gun-toting abolitionist who came and took over the church, started the church, and then left and went to bloody Kansas to advocate the anti-slavery movement. Uh, his father was a pacifist, and his father had a falling out with, with his father because of their different orientation to the place of violence in the whole human condition. And so the father is trying to find a way to reconcile himself to the grandfather, and eventually uh, probably works out. There's, a, there's another brother in the family, Edward, who is a theologian, goes to Europe to study, comes home, espouses his newfound ideas, which are uh, in the minds of his uh, father, of his father at least, are just kind of a kind of a disguised uh, atheism. So uh, the brother leaves abruptly. 
uh, eventually the father will be reconciled with the brother, and what that does is to make our friend John Ames the elder brother because he stayed home at the church, taking over the church for his father. And uh, then another piece of this story is the concern that John Ames has for his namesake, who is another prodigal son, son of his Presbyterian uh, colleague in ministry in Gilead, best friend, Jack Broughton is the son's name, and Jack's influence when he comes back to town on this young wife and this son, the things that involve, uh, involve a great deal of uncertainty and even anguish on the part of James, John Ames, who is an elderly man. And so fear of Jack's influence on his wife and son ultimately make him the, uh, ultimately make, once again, him the father, the waiting father for the, for the prodigal. So the prodigal son is, is networked through this whole thing. And in terms of what it means, it, it, many people greeted it when it was published uh, in the early 20, 21st century, greeted it as the, the one realistic perception of what uh, the plight of a minister may be, not in an Iowa setting by any means, but in a circumstance in which the minister must, uh, must bear, must uh, deal with abandonment and loneliness and all these other things and still maintain the faith. So what we have in John Ames is, is a new sort of hero martyr, not like the martyrs in Fox's book of martyrs where they get skewered with barbecue sticks or something like that, but, but like a hero whose life is made up of suffering and enduring and loving. Now, just in the couple of minutes we have now left, let's, what's the significance of all this? And I didn't say then and now because then is now, in a manner of speaking. Jackie, you've been mighty quiet. <laughs> I, one, of, one of my dear, dear former students is, is here with us today. I well, called on her in class, too. That's right, that's right. And when your professor calls on you, you have to answer. So, and I, I will. So, I think to me, and this is a book that I love very much, and I've heard Marilyn Robinson speak even on it, I think to me, for me personally, the significance is that who is the minister to ministers? You know, I think a lot, I mean, just because I'm a theologian of the church and I do serve pastors a lot and speak at pastoral retreats, I always am struck by how they want to come up and share with me, you know, their heartache, mm -hmm. their suffering, their doubts, the death of their brother. I'm just thinking of a concrete incident recently. And I, and I always think, oh my gosh, you know, that pastor is up in the front of a congregation and they have to be the strong one mm -hmm. most of the time. They have to be the person who espouses the faith and, and carries the hope. And of course, those things are real, but the grief is also real and the doubt is real and the suffering is real. And I'm always just struck by who is a minister to the ministers? Who, who is the pastor to the pastors? Who is seeing the pastor as a whole person who has all the same human suffering that the rest of us do who are not pastors? Mm -hmm. To me, that's the significance of, of this story. Right, Get that, gosh, thank you. That's, that's kind of gets to the heart of the whole thing. You know, um, in the array of possible uh, polities in the Christian tradition, the bishop is supposed to be that, but it rarely works out that way. So, yeah. who else? Significant. Sure. Yeah. The bishop is your boss. Yeah. Like in, in my church polity, the bishop is your boss. So you're, who's going to like confide in their boss all of their vulnerabilities? Yeah. I mean, the system is not really set up for pastors to have a pastor in a lot of the polities. And I'm Lutheran, so I think it's very yeah. similar. Yeah, uh, no more powerful person in Christendom than a Methodist bishop. Check, check it out, if you don't believe it. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, we have about eight minutes or so. Would you like to hear about Father Tim? Oh. Get him off the table. <laughs> you know, I, I had a hard time deciding whether to choose this particular personality or not. 
But then I realized I'd read most of these books. So it's something there. Written by Jan Karen, uh, North Carolina native, grew up in Lenore, uh, very troubled childhood, dropped out of school when she was uh, in junior high school, got married at 14, uh, had a strange path to the career of a writer, uh, it, which involved uh, uh, three marriages along the way, uh, working in an ad agency off and on and starting off as kind of a gopher in an ad agency and having such a flair for writing advertisements and publicity things that she moved up through the ranks and became a person who was very much valued, although she had not, uh, literally had not finished junior high school. Uh, her faith pilgrimage is something to behold, uh, from unbelief to Unitarian to Judaism. Mr. Karen, who, to whom she was married briefly, was Jewish, and she made a real effort to become Jewish herself. Uh, then, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, into the kind of mega church world of, of Charlotte, as it turned out, uh, and finding uh, her real affinity for more orthodox Christianity at that point, and then eventually becomes a card-carrying Episcopal with uh, an honorary canon status in one of the uh, one of the, one of the dioceses in the Midwest. So she kind of made this pilgrimage. The books, uh, more than a dozen, about this particular. Uh, circumstance, Mitford circumstance, were written between 1994 and 2017, and they sold by the hundreds of thousands. Mostly, the books were set in the North Carolina mountains in the town of Mitford. Read Blowing Rock there if you have any doubt. In the town of Mitford, where she lived for a while, Father Tim, the Episcopal priest in Mitford, is the focal person in the whole series. He comes to this church as a 60-something-year-old bachelor and arrives and meets and marries his new neighbor, Cynthia. Uh, he also adopts along the way a dog, which it is said is as big as a Buick, uh, and a problem child named Dooley, who eventually makes his way in the world as a veterinarian. And there are numerous other parishioners who come into the, the lives of uh, Father Tim and Cynthia through all these stories. And, and the real thing that's happening here, and I think maybe the thing which causes this, these books to be so incredibly popular is, in all of this variety of pastoral and community and personal issues, it is clear from the very beginning, you, you talk about these books as being Christian books in a manner of speaking, but in anything that happens, it's clear to you that underlying the whole thing, there's a benevolent God in control. And that divine providence is prevailing in all of these complicated situations of life. And in Mitford, at least, we are asked to suspend any disbelief that we have and come to an almost smug appreciation of the fact that God's in his heaven, all, God's in God's heaven, all's right with the world. So this is the thing. There's about 14, 15 of these books. Then there's a, there's a Father Tim cookbook. Father Tim was a diabetic. And, and he always got in trouble with some kind of orange sponge cake at Christmas time. Uh, and he had a heart problem, all these things. But, but Father Tim's got a cookbook. Father Tim's got a book of prayers. There's not a real Father Tim, but there's a book of prayers that he prays. So she has really capitalized on this. And most recently, in Hudson, North Carolina, where she did some of her growing up on her grandparents' farm, there is a Mitford Museum, to which we all have to go sometime soon, I hope. Well, that, that's a quick and dirty on that. Anybody got any comments on it in about two minutes? Is there a significance? I think it's that Father, Father Tim lived his faith. Hmm? Yes, he did. And still behind it. I think there's... <clears throat> Excuse me. There's such an innocence and wholesomeness about the entire book, the characters, even though they may have moments where there's something in the community, one may get on the other's nerves, they always seem to work it out. Exactly. And uh, it's just good, wholesome escapism that's entertaining, and I think that's the significance. It allows people to escape to a good place. And there is a significance that it came into our lives at this particular juncture in life when there's so many other things that are a counterforce to that, too, I think. 
I alluded to this briefly, but your first two examples were scoundrels. The uh, main characters, ministers, were scoundrels or evangelists. In the second two, um, what you were saying, uh, she's gone, your prize student back here, um, about the humanity of uh, pastors mm -hmm. shows forth in both of them. And I would cite further some of the British uh, um, television things at this point. Father Brown is a very interesting character. Hope that comes up next week, by the way. That's what? Next week, if I can find a film clip, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, if I'm not mistaken, it's Midsummer Murders, a little town that has more murders per square <laughs> population than anywhere else, but there's a, uh, an Episcopal priest there that is very human. So these latter, what we're seeing in literature here, or, 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 or film or whatever, books, um, is a much more positive understanding than the first two examples, and uh, maybe that's a rebound factor that we've seen a lot of negative things happening mm. that we really want to read something good. Yeah, I'm sure that's so. Uh, one other, uh, a book that I read paired uh, Father Tim with Pastor Enquist from Lake Wobegon <laughs> as one of, one of God's fools, or you know, just going that way, doing what they do, and everything works out wonderfully. And the, the the story that was cited there, you all will remember from Lake Wobegon when Father, when Pastor Enfist hosts uh, something like tw 22 Lutheran pastors and he takes them out on a pontoon boat and it sinks. It's just hilarious, but it, it, it bespeaks this kind of faithfulness that doesn't, doesn't take umbrage at the things that are happening in life. Missy, you have a comment? Well, just, I think you kind of said this, but I think it's significant that Father Tim has to do with, with a complicated um, environment we live in with all the things that, all the unanswered questions about medicine and, you know, our, what's happening to our earth and people divided into two camps and all that. And here's a quiet place with almost a Jesus kind of a character. Mm -hmm. That's, that's good. Those who get the Father Jesus kind of stuff, that's where Jesus and Father, and I believe you won't be the, the uh, Catholic priest. Yeah, yeah. The parishioners would often go to the other one for a second opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. Thank you all for this. Time's up, but it's been fun. I appreciate your contribution, and you're going to talk next week, too. So. Thank you, John. Final exam won't take more than 15 minutes. As always, we appreciate John uh, more than you know. Thank you. Um, look forward to next week. <laughs>